Hey everyone, welcome back to Barter Hordes. My name is Robert. Happy Friday, happy Juneteenth. Um, it has been another crappy reading week for me. Um, actually, it's been a five star reading experience for me. I finished two books, and if you add the ratings together, they equal five stars. Um, I have been in a slump for over a month now, very little positive reading. Fortunately, other things going on have kept me upbeat, but my reading has not. And that continued this week. I finished two books from the original long lists for this year's Booktube Prize, both novels. Uh, the first one is Inland by Taya Obret. And this is set in the Arizona territories, uh, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, etc. Uh, in the in the 1890s, I think it might have been 1893, but the exact year doesn't really matter that much. And it's it tells two different storylines. One storyline is about a woman named Nora, whose husband is the editor of their little area's newspaper, and he has gone because they're in the middle of a drought. He has gone looking for the water man uh, because he's been cheating them and he's been missing for several days she doesn't hadn't heard from him she doesn't know where he is and her two older sons apparently went after a rumor that somebody had done him harm and they're now missing as well and are being looked for by the sheriff so the first storyline is is Nora's the second storyline is about a young man who is running from the law he is beaten somebody who later died and so he's now linked to a notorious gang and he's he's running out west to hide from them and he ends up hooking up with the camel corps and becomes attached to a particular camel named burke whom he talks to throughout most of this book and his story is mostly his wanderings through the southwest and the two stories do collide, so to speak, at the end of the book, but not in a way that really sheds light on either of the stories. My biggest problem with this book is there isn't really a story. There are some events that happen in the background, but there's not really much going on. Nora's family is struggling with the drought and her husband being missing, and the, the camel core is wandering through the Southwest, being used as, as pack animals primarily, and it just talks about being with camels. Um, the book jacket irritated me because it talks about how this book reimagines the myths of the American West, and it doesn't. It, it, it reads exactly like every other story about the American West in the late 19th century, except with camels. And it just, it doesn't change any of our ideas or conceptions about what the American West was like. So I just didn't think there was much to this story. Her writing is fine. Um, I didn't hate it, but there was just nothing there to, to latch onto for me. It was not for me because I just didn't see much of a story there. So the second book I picked up promised to be very different because it's an epic fantasy and that's Black Leopard, Red Wolf by Marlon James which is supposed to be, I think it's the first book in a proposed trilogy. Uh, I will not be reading any further books in this series. Um, first of all, it's 620 pages. And let me just say, that's pretty self-indulgent. It does not need to be 620 pages, especially 620 pages that are so similar to each other. Um, the idea of the book is fascinating. James is taking elements of African mythology, African history, and then pure fantasy and blending them together. Now, this isn't on James, but some people have said that this is an African version of the Game of Thrones. And I'm not really sure it is, although there are some elements of the story that are suggestive of the same style fantasy, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily a fair comparison. Although in the end, he does kind of set up this 
future storyline that there might be something like winter is coming. Um, he throws in the last 20 pages or so. This book has lots of issues, some of which bothered me, some of which didn't, but bothered other people. That is one, the length that bothered me. Two, it is extremely violent and extremely filled with sex of every variety, including incest, including, um, uh, there was, there was something else I wanted to mention about the sex in the book besides, oh, bestiality. There's lots of incest, lots of bestiality, and it's just everywhere. And some people are offended by it being there at all. Other people like me are more offended because that seems like that's the whole point of the book. Um, for me though, the biggest sin that Marlon James commits in this book is that it's boring. At no time during this entire epic fantasy adventure did my heart ever race with anticipation or anxiety or anything that you expect from a Lord of the Rings type adventure where the characters are in mortal peril all the time. The characters in his books are in mortal peril from page one on, but you never really care about them because it's so bloody confusing. It's so bloody repetitive in some ways and vague in other ways that I just did not care. My, my friends, when I said something about it after the first 50 or 100 page, all said, abandon it. Don't put yourself through that. But I'm stubborn and foolish, and I read to the end, and they were right. It didn't change. Um, some people have complained that it is misogynist, uh, and it is pretty sexist throughout the book. Um, but my biggest complaint is that it was just dull. That many times referring to violence and sex it loses its impact. Uh, if that's what you're going for is an impact. I, this book was not for me. There are people on Goodreads who will tell you how profound this book is, how wonderfully written it is, how creative and new the imagination is. Fine, if that's what you want, enjoy it. But for me, this book made me dislike fantasy and I've had very little experience with fantasy and some of my experiences have been good, some have been bad. If you remember my review of Dune, you know what I thought of that book. Uh, but I read the George R. R. Martin books. I'm not a huge fan of the books. I love the HBO show, um, but I'm not dead set against fantasy. I'm just dead set against being bored for 620 pages. So two for two this week, duds for me. Uh, if you love those books, don't take it personally. I'm not judging you as a person as for me as a reader, they were swings and misses. So I retreated into something I knew I was gonna like. And so now I'm reading uh, the 11th book in the Louise Penny series. This is my June entry for the one a month that I've been doing in her series. And that is The Nature of the Beast. And I've just started it. So I, I really can't say anything about it yet. Um, and the next book I'll be picking up in the Book Two Prize long list uh, is another fantasy, unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, I don't know. And that's The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern. And I have not read Morgenstern's famous one, The Night Circus. I have it on reserve at the library. My library just reopened for by reservation only curbside pickup, but they immediately wiped out all the suspension holds in the computer system. So I got an email yesterday that five books are waiting for me at the library that I was not planning on picking up for a while. So that's one of them, I believe, is, is the Night Circus. So I'm going to give uh, The Starless Sea a go and see if it gives me any better experience than I had with the Marlon James. Uh, in terms of my other projects, I did watch another movie in my AFI Best Films project. I watched the 1997 film Titanic, and I kind of threw some shade at Titanic last week when I told you that was my next movie up. And I have to admit that I enjoyed it this time a whole lot more than I remember enjoying it back in the 90s when it came out until the very last scene. Uh, and if you haven't watched it, I mean, there has to be a statute of limitation on spoilers for a film that's now 23 years old. Um, but there's a frame tale about a diver who's looking for treasure on the wreck of the Titanic and they find a, a, a sketch in a safe 
that has a passenger, Kate, uh, Kate Winslet's character, uh, Rose. It's a sketch of her wearing this lost, priceless, heart-shaped diamond pendant. And Rose is now 101 years old, sees the news story about this and calls the guy and says, I can tell you all about that. And so they fly her to the ship in the middle of the Atlantic. And the, the movie, the story of Titanic itself is Rose's memories of the voyage of the Titanic from her point of view. And then at the very, and I'm fine with all of that, but at the very end, supposedly on the day Rose dies, because right after this, you see Rose walking up the grand staircase, shaking hands and saying hi to all these dead passengers, including Leonardo DiCaprio's char character. And uh, supposedly on the day she dies, and at 101 years old, out in the Atlantic Ocean, she climbs the ship's railing to get a better look over the side. And then she throws this necklace into the sea that she's been hiding for 84 years, this priceless diamond necklace. Now, her caretaker is her granddaughter. If I'm her granddaughter, Rose is going over that railing after that necklace. That is the dumbest ending to a film I think I've ever seen. And so they had me for three hours until that happened. And then I just, no, that's just, it's just ridiculous. They should have stopped with the sinking of the Titanic and ditched the frame story because the frame story sucked. Um, if you love Titanic, that's fine. Again, these are my opinions, but I'm feeling cranky. I'm now in my fourth month of quarantine, like all of you are, and I'm, I'm on cranky meds right now. I should be. Now, to make things worse, guess which movie my random generator called up for the next one in my project? That's right. 1939's Gone with the Wind, which is ironic, timely, just everything you can imagine right now at this time in our country's history. Now, I have never actually seen Gone with the Wind. I was supposed to see it when I was a junior in high school with a girl I was dating, and I had just arrived at her house. We were going to watch it with her family. They watched it every year, I guess. I don't know. She had seen it several times. And the phone rang, and it was my father. He had gotten a call from someone. I was living in Fort Worth at the time. He had gotten a call from someone at TCU that they had called an emergency rehearsal of an ensemble that I was in performing the next week at TCU. So I ended up having to leave and not see the movie anyway. I haven't read the book either, but you know, I know about the book and I know about the movie, but not from firsthand experience. So my random generator thought it would be fun to put me through that this week. So the next one on my list is Gone with the Wind. Now I won't be watching it on HBO Max since they have pulled it temporarily to add some level of context to the film, uh, but I'm pretty aware of the context. So I'm gonna watch it. Uh, it's another, tremendously long movie. I may have to split this one up into two days because it's nearly four hours long. So that was my movie project this week. My K-dramas this week have been great, so I at least have that to look forward to. I finished watching Nightmare Teacher, which I told you about last week. It's a very short series about a high school in Korea, a junior class, 11th grade class, where several students end up signing Faustian style contracts with the counseling teacher to get special powers. And of course, they all end badly. I finished that one. And then I picked up one called Chocolate, um, which it's kind of hard to describe. The main female character in this one, as a little girl, went to this resort town by the sea with her family and she wandered into a restaurant where a young boy was helping his mom. His mom runs the restaurant. And she was so hungry that the little boy felt sorry for her and just fed her this fantastic meal. She fell in love with food and with the little boy. And then she was supposed to come back for lunch. He promised to make her a chocolate dessert for lunch, but her parents apparently got in an argument and they left, went back to Seoul. And so she didn't get to fulfill that promise of going back for lunch. Uh, she is later abandoned by her mother on the day of Seoul's 
department store collapse. This apparently ties directly into a historical event that really happened. She doesn't die in that event, but she's trapped in the department store for a while. And of course she's traumatized by that. And then it skips ahead to when she's an adult and she becomes a chef, probably because of the food experience she has as a little child. And she ends up meeting the little boy again, who's grown up to become a doctor. She doesn't immediately let him know that she's the little girl from that day, but they end up forming a working tense relationship and it gets complicated from there. Um, but this is one that if you're gonna watch a K-drama, this one you have to go in with a healthy supply of tissues. Because starting for me in episode three, it was a tearjerker all the way through. And I just got a message from Alba, uh, who's reading this now from the channel, Siriella. She's watching this one now. And she said the, the tears started for her in episode two. And it's, it's a tear fest all the way through. It's so sad, partly because it's set in later years. It's set in a hospice and you meet all these terminally ill patients. Um, but that one was very good. Then I watched another one that I thought was very short. It only had eight episodes and each episode was only about 45 minutes called Love Alarm. But it turns out that was just season one and season two doesn't come out until August. So I'm stuck in the middle of a series there. Uh, this is a little bit like a Black Mirror episode. It's, it starts off in a high school class where an anonymous app developer comes out with an app called Love Alarm that if you download it, and you are within 10 meters of somebody else who has the app and who is interested in you, who's attracted to you, who loves you, your love alarm app will signal that somebody's interested in you, but it won't tell you who. Um, and so you can imagine all the permutations of both you know, excitement in a high school about an app like this and the potential problems of an app like this. Uh, and so I've watched the first season. I have to wait till August to see the second season. And then I started one. There are three series called Reply and then a year name, uh, a year number. And I'm not sure if they all are involved with the same families or if each one is a different set of families. But the one I'm watching is Reply 1988. And the reason 1988, if you remember sports history, that's the year that Seoul hosted the, the Olympic Games. And so it's following five families who live on the same block. And the children are all friends. They go to school together. They've grown up together. The parents all know each other very well. And it's, it's a little bit absurd and ridiculous at times because some of the acting is so funny and there's goat noises and everything else. But it is so touching in a way. Um, I am absolutely just entranced with it. So I can't wait to watch the rest of that one and then go on to the one, I think it's 1994. And then there's one in 1997. And I think the one in the middle might be the one that's tied to that famous department store collapse in Seoul. I'm not sure, but that's what I read somewhere. Um, so anyway, I've had a good week of K-dramas and fortunately, they send me to bed every night in a good mood because I do that at the end of the day. The last thing I wanna talk about is my music project because a couple of weeks ago, I threw some shade at Franz Josef Haydn because all of his symphonies sound to me essentially the same. And the editor of this compendium that I pulled my project list from included, he must've included 60 of these short symphonies by Haydn. And I kind of cast aspersions on them a couple of weeks ago and a couple of people in the comments laughed at my Haydn shade. And so I'm gonna make it worse this week. There was a piece that I listened to this week that I had not heard in a long time. And it's called Variations on a Theme by Haydn, but it's by the romantic composer Johannes Brahms. He was struggling to get comfortable with writing his first symphony and orchestration on a big scale. And he did this kind of as an exercise because he was good at the idea of a theme and variations. And it was a way of experimenting with some different orchestral um, sounds. And it's a wonderful piece. It's actually one of his most perfect popular pieces now. Uh, but it's, it's almost like he's taken a theme by Haydn, which you've heard, six million and three times in all his, his symphonies and he has updated it for the romantic period and it's it's absolutely gorgeous it's a beautiful piece 
Come to find out, music historians now don't think the original theme was even by Haydn. So Haydn loses again. Poor guy. Um, anyway, so I've included a picture of the album that I listened to this week. And as always, I've included all of these works that I've listened to in a list in the description box and then on a massive playlist on Apple Music, which is now about six days long, six days worth of music. So it's getting pretty big. Uh, if you want to experiment with any of those, the recordings I listened to as I was doing this project are all included there. Okay, that's been my week. I, like the last several weeks, almost didn't film this because it meant I had to shave. Uh, my beard was driving me crazy because it was incredibly itchy. My hair is just an unmanageable mess because I haven't had a haircut in four months. Um, but here we are, another video, another Friday Reads. I hope you have a good weekend planned, a weekend at home. Um, hashtag believe science. Hashtag I'm sick of seeing hashtag social distancing on people's Instagrams while they're out partying with their friends. I don't think you know what that term means. So I, I, I'm losing patience with people who are so selfish and ignorant that they won't believe science. If you don't believe science, don't watch my channel because you're not gonna like most of what I have to say. Um, the pandemic is not over. At least 10 to 20 states are recording record highs. And of course, our president think it's just because we're testing. If we don't test, suddenly we won't have anybody with the disease. That's the kind of logic leading our country right now. So if you support that kind of logic, again, don't watch my channel. Um, if you think that's absurd, yell at your neighbors, <laughs> yell at your friends, I don't care. Yell at your family members. We are gonna hit 200,000 deaths by the time of the election. We're already at 120,000 and we're not even trying. It, it's just, we've given up as a country. We've given up on this pandemic and it's going to pay us back. And it is right now. You have so many states now with record levels of new infections, including North Carolina. We now have among the top three or four states, the highest number of new cases every single day. But you'd never know it by people around here. Okay, enough. I'm going, I'm gonna go watch something to make me smile. Talk to y'all soon, maybe, bye.